aeration blowers, have you got the power? Before we begin, I'd like to say a quick thank you to our sponsor, Atlas Copco. I'd also like to introduce today's presenter, Travis McGar. Travis is the business line manager for blowers and low pressure products for Atlas Copco in the United States. He has spent over a decade in the industry as a, and has consulted with wastewater companies and designed application process applications across the globe, bringing efficiency and reliability to their operations. I would like to take a minute to ask you to please open the chat area in the lower right corner of your screen. If your chat module is not open, you can select that chat icon located at the bottom right corner. In the chat box, you will see options next to the word to. If you have any technical problems today, please change that to option to host. If you have any questions or comments for Travis, go ahead and keep that as everyone. As a reminder, a recording will be available um, later today at the webbuyersguide.weborg, and we will send all registrants an email tomorrow with this link. And Travis, I will go ahead and pass things over to you. All right, sounds good. Let me share quickly. All right, if everyone, or maybe Joy, if you can confirm, we can see the screen. I can see it. Thank you. Great. All right. Uh, to start off with, thanks everyone for joining today. We're going to talk uh, about blowers and different variations of power in our blower products and others as well. So a quick agenda. Um, first, we're going to talk about operating power. Uh, this would be a quick overview of some of the technologies currently available and not too in-depth, very quick top-level views. Um, a little bit about how ambient conditions and, and the proper sizing of these machines and a quick note on how dirty filters affect your process. Then we'll talk about power loss, uh, which is a good question that we get a lot about how machines react to a power loss, especially high-speed turbo technology. We'll talk about that and some generator considerations. And then we'll finish off with manpower. And by this, we're talking about service uh, operators, service uh, expertise and maintenance and remote monitoring on equipment. So starting off with operating power, I wanted to open the uh, open the presentation with a quick question to see how many people have a good idea of this. How long ago were rotary low blowers invented? So if you want to put your questions in the chat there or your answers in the chat, sorry. Give it a little bit of time. I expect to see a lot of different answers here. All right, anywhere from 30 to over 100 years old. I see 150 here, so let's take a quick look. Over 160 years at this point. Um, so a fun fact, um, many of you probably still know rotary load blowers as roots blowers or as PD blowers. Uh, and the lower left picture here that's uh, drawn there is a wooden water wheel. So it used to move water from one place to another. Uh, and supposedly the story is the Roots brothers were in their shop working on water wheels that they made uh, and spun the shaft by hand and blew one of the brothers hats off their head. And from there on out, they decided they could move air with these same type of machinery uh, and invented air blowers at that time. So all the way back in 1856. Um, so we've been talking about blowers for a, a long time at this point. Uh, a few of the other pictures on here, multi-station tropical blowers have been around for over 100 years as well at this point in the middle picture. And then we have newer technologies that are coming, screw blowers, high-speed turbo blowers in the past two to three decades that have improved efficiency um, and changed how we, how we view some of the modern technology. So here's a quick split um, of the technology. And these are the kind of the five major technologies that you'll find for wastewater treatment aeration, definitely the main aeration process. Uh, there are smaller blowers um, uh, and some other technologies that are a little less prevalent, but these are the five main aeration ones. We have centrifugal technologies on the left, multi-stage centrifugal, integrally geared and high-speed direct drive or high-speed turbo blowers as most people as most people would refer to them. And on the right, we have positive displacement machines. 
Um, that's a split on how these machines fundamentally operate between centrifugal and positive displacement. Uh, the original lobe blower or the roots type blower is in that category. And then newer screw type blowers um, are also in that category of positive displacement. So to start off, we're going to focus on the lobe and screw type machines in the positive displacement category. Take a look at how they operate uh, quickly, their operating principles of compression, and then what screw blowers offer in terms of efficiency savings in modern technology. So if we look quickly on the video on the right, uh, if you follow these arrows here, this is the air path through a tri-lobe blower. So the air comes into the inlet of the machine at the top and then goes around the outside of the unit before making its way to the bottom. And quickly here, the color is here. You can see that blue is the process pressure downstream uh, where you have uh, whatever your back pressure is, the process wastewater treatment plant could be 8, 9, 10 PSI, it could be higher, could be lower in some cases. Um, but as the air moves into that pocket, very quickly, the process pressure flows back into the cavity where the lobe is open to. You have ambient air in the green. As soon as it's open to the process of higher pressure, it flows back in. And at that point, it actually compresses that pocket of air. So every time you open a pocket, into the process, you're compressing it with, with the pressure. A quick work diagram is on the upper left. Um, you can kind of see where we start at one. We have pressure is ambient, P1, and we make our way up to the pressure of the process as soon as it's opens to the process. And then the volume is decreased as that pressure works on the fluid. And then we push that fluid out into the process. Usually it's going to diffusers or something else and then it's released again to atmosphere. So we complete the entire work diagram. And the blue area here is a representation of the power consumption. Obviously we need to know a lot of other characteristics, but in general, that blue area is proportional to some amount of work that the blower has done. Maybe the main note in here is that there's no internal compression inside the machine whenever it goes through the process. It's the process itself, uh, forcing air into a fixed area that eventually creates pressure. Now, if we look at a new screw blower technology, if you look at the video quickly, you'll see this blue um, chunk of air coming into the machine on the upper right and then being squeezed as it makes its way down to the bottom left, uh, getting darker in color. And that's actually it being squeezed physically in a compression stroke along the screw from ambient pressure down to some discharge pressure. A lot of screws for wastewater treatment are designed to have an inherent compression around seven to nine PSIG coming out of the port. Um, that's not what it's going to stay at. The process downstream dictates that, but that's what it will come out as inherently. And a quick note on this work diagram that we have here, since we're decreasing the pressure and the flow simultaneously as we squeeze um, this uh, ambient air, we have a compression stroke from one to two. So before with the lobe, you didn't have this stroke. And here we do. The green area you can see here would represent energy savings from the internal compression of the screw versus the traditional lobe. And the blue is, again, the, the amount of work required by the unit. So let's take a quick performance example. Um, I chose to take VFD-driven machines for this um, presentation to compare across. We're going to be running at 10 PSIG. It's a typical wastewater treatment pressure. Uh, currently at a flow of 1,500 SCFM, and we're looking at standard conditions. In the U.S., we call this roughly sea level, 68 degrees Fahrenheit, 36% relative humidity. If you look at a data sheet or catalog data or even sometimes nameplate data, a lot of times the performance that you're given is at these conditions. The total amount of load power to run these conditions for a model that we selected was 77 kilowatts, and that's the total input power to the package electrically. Um, so the power being su supplied to the motor plus the running fan if needed um, and all ancillary electrical devices, small controllers, those kinds of things. And this has a motor size of 125 horsepower. The, the motor requirement is right around um, 100 horsepower. So it's been upsized to cover that to 125 horse. Um, and that's our starting point. So this is typical low blower size for the proper application. Um, at standard conditions. All right, so the next slide, we're gonna take a look at a screw blower. Instead of the low blower, I want everyone to give me an approximate idea of what they think the energy savings is gonna be as a percentage of the total power draw versus a lobe. If you can throw those into the chat for me, I'll be taking a look to see 
what we have as an idea here. All right, I got a lot in the 15 to 20% range. Got a few people pushing into the 30s. Um, so a pretty good range from everybody. Let's take a look on the next slide. If you see there in blue, it's 25% in this case. Now, obviously this will vary depending on the exact lobe machine picked and the exact screw machine picked and amongst manufacturers. Um, but if you take a look, we've run the same conditions. The total input power is 58 kilowatts for a, a similar size screw blower. And so we're actually seeing a 25% energy savings. Normally we would say 25 to 30 is, is the typical number on average. Um, at lower pressures, it's not quite as high uh, because the lobes um, aren't compressing and we're over compressing in a screw. So as the pressure goes down, that goes down. But we also have processes running 10, 12, 15 PSI some cases nowadays. You also have elevation coming into play, which we'll talk about later, which gives us higher pressures uh, or higher pressure ratios. So somewhere in the 25 to 30% is typical, we would say can be higher, can be lower. Um, one note I would like to say though, is we just squeeze into a 75 horsepower motor on this machine. We were just under um, that requirement. So the motor size itself says we save 40%. If I just look at the two name plates, you say it's 125 horse motor and a 75 horse motor. You might think we're gonna save 40% on the unit, but it's really not that simple. You really need to look at real operating power uh, to make this analysis. This can work both ways. So we'll see later where the motor size is the same, but you still have energy savings. In this case, the motor size suggests that you have 40, in reality you have 25% when you're actually running the same conditions. So. Let's talk a little bit about the other technologies as well. Um, so here on the centrifugal side, we have three main technologies, multi-stage centrifugal, integrally geared, high-speed direct drive. I wanna talk about each of them individually quickly. Um, just about their operating principle, principles in general. Multi-stage centrifugal blowers, as I said, have been around for more than 100 years at this point. Hoffman and Lampson were the original uh, blower designs for this. Um, it's a traditional motor driving um, this multi-stage machine. You can kind of see in this picture that we have multiple impellers. Um, and the way centrifugal's technology works is they create um, speed or velocity by having an impeller rotating, uh, making impact with air, that gives the air velocity, and then we run that air that's been given velocity through a diffuser um, or a volute, or really we're slowing the air down in a defined area, and that causes the pressure to be increased when we do that. So this is done in multiple stages for a centrifugal blower, so each one of these stages is only making a small pressure rise of a half a PSI to a PSI, depending on the, the diameter of the wheels. So a machine that's running 10 PSI in the field for a wastewater plant might be six to 10 stages, each one doing a small amount of the pressure. And the amount of flow that we are making depends on the total volume of that impeller. So the bigger the diameter, the bigger the thickness of the impellers, the bigger the inlet and out of the machine means that we're getting more flow. And each of these have different impeller designs, so you can dial in a customer's design point. But in general, as you need more pressure, you're adding more stages to these machines. Um, in order to reach that pressure, and eventually you can't go any larger due to rotor dynamics. But the efficiency is quite good for the range, especially at its rated flow um, without throttling the machine to lower flows. Um, still very good efficiency, usually better than low blowers, uh, definitely at its rated flow in the, in the sweet spot of its operating map. Uh, one other note, maybe it's typically running around 3,600 RPM. Can be a little faster on VFD, uh, but these are traditional TEFC motors two pole running around the 3,600 RPM mark. Now when we take a look at integrally gear technology. If you take a look at this, um, this impeller here, you can see it looks very different. It's one impeller, single stage, um, but we're actually making a lot more flow and pressure typically with an impeller um, of a similar, of a smaller size versus a multi-stage. How do we achieve that? If you look at the far left, there's a gearbox. So you have a motor driving a bull gear and a pinion gear, and we're running these machines at 15,000 to 20,000 RPM. Some can be less, some can be more still um, on usually fluid film bearings. So oil bearings to be able to run that fast. And because we're running at such higher speeds with the impeller, 
we're able to create much more velocity in a smaller package and get much more flow and pressure in a smaller size. Um, so it's all about speed in this case, allowing you to make the flow and pressure. Efficiency goes up to being very good. Um, this technology has been around uh, for a long time in plain air compressors and blowers, uh, but still has very good efficiency. Typically the flow is adjusted with inlet guide veins, which are the yellow uh, veins on the far right and diffuser guide veins, which are the ones just outside of the impeller that you can see. And those two together adjust the flow and the efficiency range of the machine. So very good across its map, efficiency and turn down when you have both um, for the technology. And then finally, we have a high speed turbo blower core. This one's with magnetic bearings, which we'll talk about later. Um, but in this case, there's no contact between traditional bearings and the shaft, and the shaft is part of the motor. So that's why we call it a, a direct drive. It's not coupled. Um, it's it's one and the same. The stator for the and the shaft for the blower is the motor itself. Um, here we're using VFDs always to run 20 to 40,000 RPMs. Smaller units can run up to, to 40,000 or higher. Smaller unit or larger units with larger impellers will run in the 20,000 to 30,000 RPM range. So again, we have a boost in the amount of velocity that we can reach in a given size. So these get much more compact for a given uh, power size. And we end up with the best efficiency here. Um, you can imagine we could have two identical impellers between an inner geared and a magnetic bearing machine or an air bearing turbo blower. And because you don't have any friction losses of traditional bearings, you're saving a lot of energy in this case. So we take a quick look, I've pulled performance for a multi-stage blower here. Um, if you're not familiar with centrifugal performance maps, um, this one on the right is a VFD driven package. The red line at the top um, is the maximum speed for this multi-stage blower. The black line is its minimum speed or maybe its minimum effective speed. It could probably run lower, but this is the usable performance range that we have with this unit. Uh, and you can see that as the flow varies, the pressure varies uh, for the machine, or as the pressure varies, the flow varies. That's the more accurate way to say it. Um, but here I've chosen 10 PSI like we had before. We're running standard conditions again. Uh, this time, the map is showing a coupling power listed there of 135 kilowatts. The total power draw is 141 kilowatts, which we'll get to in a second. And the motor size is 200 horsepower. And here I've made sure to include an inlet air filter and its losses and a check valve. So that way we can compare properly to um, a high-speed turbo blower in a second. And you can see roughly what the efficiency is here. Um, so if you compare it to the low blowers before, this is double the flow. We're a little bit less than double the power. Uh, earlier we were 77 kilowatts. If you double that, we're a few percentage points, maybe five uh, to 10% better than, than the low technology. Maybe a quick question here is why the total power is higher than the shaft power uh, for this machine. Um, don't necessarily have to throw answers out here. If anyone knows the answer, feel free to put it in the chat um, before I say it here. But 141 kilowatts, 135 kilowatt input power. Uh, a lot of times the multi-stage machines are rated at shaft power, which tells you how much power you need to drive it with an electric motor. Um, and so once you have the electric motor size for that, you might have a less efficient motor or a more efficient motor, and that changes the total input power. You have a certain amount of power coming in the motor, and then you have electrical losses, and then you have the shaft power itself. And if you have a VFD in there, you have VFD losses as well, as someone mentioned. Um, so it's always a little bit higher. You'll see these curves. It's best not to compare shaft powers to total package powers or electrical powers. It's something to watch out for to make sure that we compare apples to apples if you're looking at a an energy consumption uh, and something to make sure that you take into account specifying equipment or purchasing equipment. All right, similar question to before. If I'm going to size a similar high speed turbo blower to the previous case, what percent efficiency gain do we think we can expect here? Throw your numbers in the chat. Let's see what kind of range we get. Percentage efficiency. Turbo blower to multi stage. And we're talking about, for, for sake of anyone taking a look here, we're talking about peak performance. So, peak efficiency. So, the best point that we ran previously with the multi stage, it was very it sized in a very good spot versus the turbo, it'll be sized in, a, in an efficient spot. Across the range, it can be a little bit different, but. 
All right, a good number of responses here between 15 and 25%, I would say is the bulk of the answers, um, which is pretty good. So the actual power savings, if you see here in blue is 22%. Um, so a high speed turbo blower that we selected for the same 3000 SCFM, same conditions, uh, had a total power draw of 110 kilowatts. If you look at it in the map here to the right, uh, it's a little more in the center of its map, not as high up, um, but in a very efficient spot running 120, 110 kilowatts is 22%, really good. However, this machine has a 200 horsepower motor. Um, so if you were to simply compare motor sizes quickly between the multi-stage and the turbo, you might conclude, I don't have any energy savings. I have a 200 horse multi-stage, I have a 200 horse turbo, I'm not saving anything. Um, but as you can see, we have a little more operating range that we can make here. So we go above 110 kilowatt, a peak up to around 140. Um, so if we were using more flow in this frame size, uh, we would be making use of the motor, but at this point, we still have 22%. So it's really important. Just want to make that note about motor size to motor size is not always the best indicator of your performance. You always want to get um, performance data at your site conditions, which we'll talk about in a second, um, and at your actual design points uh, and not just uh, data, catalog data. What makes the high-speed turbo blower more efficient. We talked a little bit about the bearings here, um, but I've got a few pictures so we can talk about those and some of the other technology. Um, almost all high speed blowers come with permanent magnet synchronous motors. That's a newer motor technology. If you can look in the picture, there's actually magnets either glued or inside of a sleeve inside the shaft of the blower. Um, and because of those permanent magnets, you don't have induction losses like you would have an induction motor where you need to induce a magnetic field in the shaft of the rotor. In this case, you don't have that. So you have a few percentage efficiency gains. If I take a large NEMA premium motor, you're probably talking about 95 to 96% efficiency. For permanent magnet motors, we're up at 98%, and it holds a more steady percentage as the uh, load is reduced. So at half load or a quarter load, these are holding around 98% efficiency where a, an induction motor starts to fall off. So if you look at the shaft picture a little bit later, um, we're holding our uh, magnets in and our turbo blower in with the carbon fiber sleeve. You have to have something to hold them on there when the shaft's running 30,000 RPM to keep them from flying off. Second topic will pick up here is a water-cooled motor. Not everyone is using a water-cooled motor in high-speed turbos. It can be done air-cooled, um, but a water-cooling allows you to have better heat transfer from the windings of the motor out um, and then slightly decrease your, your motor size. If I can pull more heat out, I can get tighter clearances around the stator and get slightly better efficiency. We're not talking about too much here, um, but better reliability, better cooling, keeping all the windings run cooler or, you can make, or allow you to run higher powers in the same size package. Um, so good, uh, good feature to have for most of them. And then the big topic that makes, uh, high speed turbo blowers possible is running at these very high speeds, which, uh, traditional ball bearings can't allow. So you need to have either magnetic bearings or airfoil bearings. Um, both of these allow you to have no contact between the running shaft and the rest of the machine. Magnetic bearings work by taking electrical pulses. If you see here, there's a, a set of electric coils around the outside diameter of that uh, magnetic bearing. And we're sending electrical pulses around the magnetic bearings through the different coils um, several thousand times per second to keep the shaft running where it's supposed to be. So when you turn the machine on, it levitates the shaft to get ready to run and it's not touching anything. And as it's running, it's making constant adjustments, looking at where the shaft was a few seconds ago or a few milliseconds ago, predicting where it's going to be, and then putting current um, in place to try to keep that shaft running where it needs to be. Uh, magnetic bearings, because of all of the complexity going on, can hold very tight impeller tolerances. You don't have a lot of movement of that shaft away from its geometric center, uh, and you also have no contact during starting and stopping. So it levitates, you start the machine, um, it's running levitated. When you stop the machine, typically it's setting down on ball bearings that are there for rest, but they're not contacting whenever the machine's actually running. It's just there in case um, when it needs to set down in order to be able to set down on something. And then airfoil bearings. So airfoils work on a principle that running a shaft with air next to it will want to pull the, sh the air underneath it. This doesn't really happen at slow speeds, but as you approach 5,000 RPM plus, um, 
the air starts to pull under the shaft and this small foil is usually Teflon coated of some kind and allows the shaft to start spinning and then creates an air film. And that air film is between the shaft and usually a top foil and a bump foil. The bump foil is a spring, so you have a little bit of load capacity. If you receive a bump, the bump foil compresses a little bit. They're very small, um, but it's enough to ex absorb certain loads and you have good load capacity, especially for smaller units. The aero efficiency is very good uh, as well. Like I said, very similar, not quite as tight of tolerances can be held always, um, depending on the amount of heat gain um, and, and where the loading is done. And there is a little bit of contact during start stops. So typically you have a rated number of start stops for the bearings can be tens of thousands, um, but you have a slight wear of the top coating Teflon or whatever it is, each time the machine starts and eventually that can wear off and, and, uh, and slightly wear over time. Doesn't mean they need to be replaced. Sometimes they last 10, 20 years. Sometimes if you have a process that's starting and stopping more often, they need to be replaced more often. Let's talk about ambient conditions. So I've taken our turbo blower um, that we just talked about and very quickly wanted to take a look at um, some efficiency here. So if I go from the 68 degrees Fahrenheit that we had at our standard conditions and move to 100 degrees Fahrenheit, currently we're at 110 kilowatts roughly, and we're going to move to 118 kilowatts. So if you ask someone for some performance data or you pull something from online and it's at standard conditions, but you're really going to be running at 100 degrees in the summer, which is typical of a lot of places now, at least at the at the worst case conditions, you can guess that you're going to be running you know, 7% more or 8 kilowatts more in this case, more power at your real conditions to try to get 3,000 SCFM in the summer. On this next slide, I have room temp listed up here. Um, like I said, 100 degrees is a pretty typical summer day in some places. I'm in Houston. It's definitely typical for us for the next few weeks. Um, but a lot of times what happens is these machines are put into rooms with other equipment and you have heat rejected into the room and just used fans for ventilating. So if it's 100 degrees outside and you have heat rejected into the room, it's very possible that you have 110 or 115 degrees in the room uh, from the heat rejection. So 100 outside, let's say you size the machine for that in the summertime, then you put it into a room and it didn't account for it. Now we're running 123 kilowatts. That's 11% more power than what you might have predicted at standard conditions or a few percent more than you would have predicted running 100 degrees Fahrenheit in the summer. And if you look at the curve, we're very, very near the maximum operating um, pressure and flow that we can get out of this machine now. So if you had size one closer and instead of running 100 degrees maximum, you're running 115, now you're short on flow versus what you originally thought you would get. Elevation. So I'll go through this one kind of quickly. Elevation is a similar effect. So if we're at 68 degrees, but instead of sea level, we're at 3,000 feet, maybe you forgot to uh, specify where you were or someone assumed that you were at sea level, um, it's a very similar effect. So 14% power increase going from standard conditions up to 3,000 feet, that's not that high. Um, there's a good number of places that are quite a bit higher than this. They can, this can get very drastic. Uh, if you're in Denver, for instance, uh, and you size a machine based on catalog data, I think I'm sure a lot of you guys know that if you've dealt with it in the past, um, but you can see, Big power increase, important to have your elevation nailed down as well. And we're, again, very close to the maximum operating pressure and flow for this unit. And now here I've combined them. So let's go from standard conditions, you're at 68 degrees. Now instead you're at 115 degrees. You go from sea level to 3,000 feet above sea level um, from where you started. And I can't pull a total power. So this model that I've been running here previously, I can't run. I can't run 3,000 SCFM. Uh, because now that's too big for the blower to get to, and I need a larger frame size. So in this case, I went ahead and pulled a larger frame size with the 250 horsepower motor. The total power draw was 133 kilowatts, or about a 21% increase. So I, I'm sure you guys can get the point here. It's very important not to compare either catalog data to real operating data, or just in general to get your real operating data to your blower manufacturers or people who are running your performance data, your engineering firms who are sizing your equipment ends up making a big difference. You can have machines that are short on flow, um, that don't operate the way you expected them to. In some cases, you might end up in, in areas where you're surging the machine if the pressures get too high or if they're at elevation. So uh, I, I think a real place to look at this is replacing old equipment. Sometimes old equipment has old data or a nameplate. And if you size for that exact same thing, you might end up in a case where you don't have equipment that's properly sized. 
one more dirty dirty filter energy costs um this is one we see a lot sometimes we see people replace their filters religiously when they're supposed to sometimes they don't um a typical clean filter will be two inches of water column of pressure drop across the filter and then usually that's a recommended replacement around 10 inches of water column that seems like a pretty small um amount of pressure. If you convert it to PSI, we're talking about a few tenths of a PSI. Uh, but if you let it get really dirty, you might reach 15 or even 20 inches of water column. Um, power percentage increase. If you want to throw something in here, go ahead. Uh, but I'll throw it up here. If you're going to go from when you would replace it at the middle ground of 10 inches of water column up to 15 or 20 inches, we're talking about a 7.6% increase in power, which is a lot. I think it's a lot higher than a lot of people realize. If you if you run six months past your 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 filter change time and you continue to run with the filter that dirty, that's the, about the power increase you're seeing. So we went from 110 kilowatts to 118, uh, if you remember from the original slide. If you have a 200 horsepower turbo, 10 cents per kilowatt hour, running 700 hours per month, that's mostly full time. So maybe it's a little bit less than that, but if you have a machine that's always running, you're talking about $588 every month. Um, so filters like this tend to be expensive for this equipment. They're very nice filters. They have low pressure drops, uh, but you can imagine if you're running a few months with a dirty filter, you probably have paid for the labor and the filter pretty quickly. So just a, just something to keep in mind. All right, moving on to the next topic, let's talk about power loss. So the main cause of power loss, I think, uh, definitely operators and plants know is usually the weather, right? You have some sort of storm roll in, uh, it causes a widespread outage that's not planned uh, and brings your equipment down, your whole plant down, can be for minutes, can be for a few seconds, can be for days. Um, so that's the main cause. There's also planned outages where you might need to take a certain part of the plant offline for a certain amount of time, or sometimes someone threw a breaker. Um, you said, hey, can you go turn the power off to, uh, to this pump? And instead, someone threw the breaker to your blowers. Uh, I don't think that's as common, but can happen, machine could be running. Uh, so it's good to know what happens whenever you lose power to some of this equipment. The effects on the machinery, it varies. Um, so if I talk about PD technology, which is the lobes and the screws, those tend to be fine when they lose power. Um, they come down in speed and reduce the power as they come down in speed and end up coming to a stop without too many effects. The check valve closes uh, and they, they're fine. Centrifugal technology needs mitigation of some kind. So on the next slide, we'll talk about why they need mitigation and get into that. Um, if you're familiar with, with centrifugal blowers and technology, there's a phenomenon called surge, um, where at a given speed, you're trying to make too much pressure. Um, so I'll show quickly here where the surge region is on this turbo blower that we talked about. So I drew a line between these, um, these points on the end. And to the left of that line is, is surge. Um, a good example of this that everyone might be able to relate to is if you take a mattress pump, the small black centrifugal pump uh, that you blow up a mattress with, you turn it on, it starts to blow the mattress up. Um, eventually what happens is the mattress gets full and the pressure is a certain area that it's filled up to and you can't get any more out of it. The, the little pump starts to make a whining sound no more airflow is going into the mattress. Instead, you're taking air and trying to blow it into the mattress, and the mattress air is backflowing back through the impeller. And you're pushing some in and pulling some out and pushing some in and pulling some out, um, and you're never putting more air into the machine. The pressure is maxed out as far as it will go. Now, on your tiny, tiny little centrifugal um, pump for your mattress, that doesn't cause any issues. The bearings can handle it, uh, but you actually have forces being put onto the impeller during that time frame from the back and forth motion of the pressure. On large centrifugal equipment of a few hundred horsepower, those forces are quite large that you see, uh, and you can trash bearings. Uh, th this applies to multi-stage machines, integrally geared machines, and high-speed turbos. Um, if you have large enough surge forces, you will fail the bearings in some way or another. Um, running integrally geared machines or the impellers in that region as well can also cause impeller damage over time, though you'll likely fail the bearings first. So what happens during a power loss? So if I take a power loss of a machine running in process uh, and it's no longer has power to it, the pressure is gonna remain relatively constant. You have a full header pipe. Um, there's a lot of energy stored in that header pipe. So as the machine comes down, that pressure is gonna continue to act on the machine. The speed is gonna be reduced because we have no power. So the speed comes down and without some sort of mitigation, we're gonna move towards surge. So if I take this operating point that we're at 10 PSI 3000, 
I lose power. I'm going to go straight to the left as the speed goes down, and I'm going to surge that unit um, whenever it turns off. may not be for very long, uh, but we're going to surge the unit on the way down. So you need some sort of mitigation against this. High-speed turbo blowers, or this is particularly a problem. Uh, Multi-stage centrifugal can usually handle the surge down for a short amount of time. The forces aren't as large. They're not quite the same setup. Uh, they tend to be oversized ball bearings. So for short surge areas, they tend to be okay. But for high-speed turbo blowers, we have two different main issues. For magnetic bearing blowers, we have obviously magnetic bearings powered by electricity. So when we lose the electricity, what happens? Well, we have to have it in place in order to keep the shaft levitated. So there's really two options. You can either have a backup UPS, which some manufacturers use. So when the power is lost, you have enough juice to get the unit to roll down. Or some manufacturers have taken the VFD bus because they all these equipment have VFDs. There's capacitors there. We can steal some of the power from the capacitors as the shaft rolls down. You still have a built up voltage and we can convert that down to power the magnetic bearings in that case. But have to have the magnetic bearings up in order to handle the small surge event, keep it rotating in its center of mass. Uh, and you can handle the surge on the way down as long as that happens. For airfoil bearings, we really don't want to handle the surge during that time frame. Um, so like I said, you can have really large forces that can cause the shaft to contact the bearings. Um, and air bearings operate really well until that happens. So 20 or 30,000 RPM, um, or if you're running down 15 to 20,000 RPM, sorry, I was looking at the chat questions there, um, can very quickly cause heat buildup and cause welding, uh, to use a, a, an appropriate term here. So this is where some machines fail. And again, you need some sort of mitigation. What typically happens for manufacturers, they have a fast relief valve. So if you have a pressure loss, typically they have a solenoid piloted, piloted valve. So if the solenoid loses power, it immediately opens. So now you've given another path for the air to go to. So the pressure is relieved. So you're not running the header pressure or some sort of spring-loaded butterfly valve that, that will very quickly open if it loses power. So those are typically how it's handled there. We relieve the pressure so we're not seeing a surge event. And I just wanna talk about generators for a quick second. Um, this doesn't happen very often, but we've had a few cases in the field that we've personally have seen. Um, VFDs have capacitor banks um, and weather in general can cause vol voltage surges down the line. Um, but Generator, ah, okay, questions there. But generator power in general um, can be a problem if you're switching live uh, power switches. Uh, what I mean by that is maybe you're running on generator power for a short time frame, and you have that generator set up to automatically switch to main power for the plant whenever the plant comes back online with the main power. If that's done immediately without giving some amount of transition time, uh, what can happen is the generator power comes off and the machine is still running with high amounts of voltage. When you kick in the main voltage, it sees a huge inrush of current coming in as the, as the voltage powers on. You get a voltage boost, and the voltage boost for capacitors can cause them to blow. Um, I'm sure some of these plants have seen this. You have blown capacitors, pretty, pretty, uh, pretty devastating effect. If you take a look here, they burn, um, or they can really you know, blow to a pretty significant degree. Um, so best practice there is to have some sort of controlled switch. It's okay to have a live uh, power transition or an automatic power transition, but usually take a 30 second downtime or something along those lines, have sort of delay timer. So that way you have controlled stops of equipment and then controlled starts of equipment. All right, let's talk about manpower. Um, so if you can read this statement here, um, it's, uh, <laughs> it's always been true, um, but definitely, uh, true to this day and continues to be more and more true as time goes on. Um, need to schedule your maintenance. This goes for your own uh, appliances in your house to this large equipment that we have out in the field. As a good indicator of this, we took a poll uh, recently. Uh, here's the poll results of things that operators were worried about for their equipment. So maintenance was number one. That's 40%. That's a pretty large uh, portion of the of the answers here. If I take reliability, heat, and noise, some of those considerations you can even roll into maintenance as well. If you have proper maintenance, reliability is less of a concern, or your reliability comes from your maintenance concerns, or noise uh, and heat in that case as well. Um, but way more um, pressing than energy efficiency or the sizing for operators themselves that need to work on the equipment. So we'll talk a little bit about self-service versus having manufacturers service the equipment. Um, 
So if you do your own service as an owner, you can expect to identify your own risks. You need to have qualified personnel and the time to work on them, keep your own records and order your own parts. If you're willing to do these things and you have well-trained technicians, this works fine. Um, this is not us saying that you can't do this. It's just saying that without doing those steps, you can plan to have either downtime or have parts be delayed or to have issues with doing the proper maintenance. Um, but those are the things you need to have in order to have a successful self-service. If you're having the manufacturer do the service, you can usually have some sort of service plan. We'll talk about in a little bit, fixed costs. Hopefully they're the ones scheduling your, uh, your parts. They can help reduce downtime by doing service at the intervals that they're supposed to be done so you don't have any parts failing. Uh, you can get those delivered on time. So quick poll, uh, and I'm not gonna take a full poll here. We're a little short on time, but if everyone can just answer here in the chat, do we think having new equipment is becoming easier to maintain or harder to maintain from an expertise standpoint? Is it easier to work on your new equipment or harder for your maintenance staff? Looking for one easier, no easier. Okay, that's I, okay. I I tend to agree with harder. Almost everyone's put harder on here. I, actually, I think everyone has. If you think about your own cars, it's getting harder to work on cars. Things are getting more complex, uh, and even though um, the complexity can bring ways for us to monitor equipment, and uh, we can all Google on our phone how to replace our own capacitor and our own HVAC system at the house. In general, you need to have more and more knowledge on a given piece of equipment, and that makes it harder to maintain. You, we're asking a lot of our techs who work on equipment and the people who do maintenance to know very detailed information about electrical equipment, other equipment, blowers, pumps, compressors. As each one gets more and more complex, that's a bigger chunk of knowledge that they need to have in order to maintain the equipment. So I'm gonna go through this very quickly. We've only got a few minutes left. These are just some of the service items on the typical blowers. So for trilow PD blowers, we need to replace air filters. We need to replace belts. We need to replace oil. Those are the very regular maintenance items, but then safety valves, check valves, um, doing rebearings need to be done, replacing motors need to be done at longer time frames. So you need to be able to do all of those things. Rotary screw blowers have a little bit less uh, maintenance. They have longer maintenance times typically for their air filters and for their oil and their oil filters, um, but still needs to be done. Those are the easy tasks. If you need to go through and redo a bearing or you need to replace check valves, those things get much harder for you to understand, or if you have electrical problems. Multi-station trivical, these are fairly easy equipment. A lot of people do their own maintenance um, because it's mostly air filters and bearing changes. Um, but you need a bearing puller, you need a guy who knows how to change bearings, you need to be a guy who can do an alignment, you need alignment tools. Um, so while it's something that a lot of people have knowledge on, you still need to have the tools, you need to pay attention to the service visits, and you need to do the service or you're going to end up paying for more. And high-speed turbo, very limited maintenance, pretty much just air filters until you have major items that need to be replaced, um, like valves, couplings, uh, fans, things like that. But when one of the bigger things breaks, that's when you're going to need to have someone who has a lot of knowledge in order to get it fixed. So, Talk about service plans quickly. A lot of manufacturers office service plans. This is just a quick comparison here about where you end up spending time. Um, breakdowns and extra energy costs are really what we're talking about. When you end up being on a service plan, and you get your air filters replaced regularly, for instance, you're saving energy there. Whenever you buy your parts ahead of time before you have a check valve failure or something else fail, now you don't have a machine down, uh, have to spend extra costs in order to get it back up or get a rental unit or get something else done. So in the long run, you wanna have either your maintenance down to have a very good maintenance uh, program and plan your maintenance well with qualified personnel, or you wanna make sure you're doing it with uh, your manufacturer. And then one last note on remote monitoring. Um, just to throw this in here, most wastewater treatment plants have this done through their SCADA system. That means you need to integrate the equipment, you need to have it tied into your SCADA, and you have call out alarms in order to tell you what's going on. Typically, that means you got to go out there to figure out what's happening, reset your equipment, and go on. This can be done, but if you have remote equipment or or other situations, it might be hard to get those equipment tied in. Most manufacturers have some sort of cell option if you have a controller. We have a system called SmartLink. You can see it from your cell phone, what's going on with your equipment. It gives you more detailed data, and you can do it right from your smartphone. So you don't have to be tied into your SCADA system. Anyone can be signed up for it. Any operator can see what's going on, get notifications. They can be told they need to service their equipment soon, and that's something that you can see from your phone. Since we're on our phones all the time nowadays, it makes it much easier. All right, so quick summary here to keep us on track of time, and then we'll take a look at questions. I know we had some in here. Um, 
if you are an engineer or if you're someone who's procuring new equipment, make sure you specify the correct new equipment, more efficient technologies for, especially for machines running 24 seven or, or the main aeration processes. Make sure you specify the right replacement equipment. Don't take old catalog data, run the same conditions and find out how you're short or make sure you're comparing your real site conditions when someone takes a look at what flows and pressures you need uh, for, your, for your site and for new equipment. And on the service side, Understand, uh, understand how your service items affect your equipment and your personnel. They need to be trained. Um, dirty air filters on the efficiency part we talked about. Plan your maintenance accordingly. Make sure you have maintenance intervals. Make sure you're taking your, uh, taking your notes or make sure you have a service plan so that way those items get done. It will definitely cost you more on a breakdown if you haven't planned for it than later on. And then consider ways to monitor your equipment. So like I said, this can be through SCADA, can be through something like our smart leak system. Make sure you have some way of monitoring the equipment. This allows you to foresee problems that you might have. You might see trends in how the pressure is changing, how the flow is changing. You might see that your plant needs something new. You might see that you've noticed you need more flow during the summertime than you thought, or that you're gonna need an expansion sooner than you planned. So these are all good topics for us to uh, keep in mind. And with that, I think we will open it up for questions. Uh, I've seen a few listed in here. Absolutely. Travis, if you would, just um, as I'm looking back through the questions, go ahead and Curtis is asking for the information that's on slide 36. If you don't mind referring back to that, what are the rough percentages on costs for purchase, maintenance, energy, et cetera? Yeah, I think, um, Okay, if we, if we take the rough percentages here, I think this is probably over, say, a 10 year time frame. Um, so the extra energy built in here, it, in, a, in a year's time frame, the extra energy is not going to cost you anything. It's continuously running. Um, but over time, the purchase price versus the, the energy price, energy becomes much higher. So I think over a 20 year period, your energy ends up being 80 or 90% of your total costs, um, especially for this equipment that's running 24 7. Could be a little bit different for, um, air scour or some other processes. Um, but then your extra energy, if you have downtime, if you have filters that aren't running, um, should also be probably in this 15 to 20% range, um, depending on how it goes. Like I said, definitely can be the case. We've seen people who have never changed their air filters over a five year period. You're definitely paying a lot more extra energy in those cases that we took a look at. Maintenance side also tends to be in the 10 to 20% range in this, uh, in this timing. Breakdown risk, that really rotates into two different categories of extra costs that you've spent getting rental equipment out there or extra costs you spent expediting parts or extra costs you spent doing um, doing other extraneous items that you couldn't plan beforehand. Right, and I do, um, I will pick one or two more questions to answer. I know that we're out of time, but I do want to refer everyone back to the um, email address info at atlascopcousa.com. If you do have questions that are unanswered, you can always reach out directly there as well. But I will um, get one or two more questions answered before we say our final goodbyes. Um, what kind of conditioning of the intake air is required for each technology? Um, we're mostly talking about filtration um, and, and, and conditioning here. Um, I'll move back to questions here just so that way that's there. Um, in general, multi-stage centrifugal and traditional low blowers don't need as um, tight of uh, filtration efficiency. There's a lot of uh, manufacturers putting just 80% um, uh, efficient at 10 micron filters on, on those types of equipment, uh, which means you're only pulling out 80% of, uh, of those at 10 or above. Um, however, I would say, uh, especially in wastewater treatment, if if that's what you have upstream conditioning and what's coming into the machine, that's going to be passed on downstream into your diffusers if you have diffusers. So having less um, stringent filtration will affect your diffuser lifetime as well. Um, I think the the bigger standard that we see a lot of times, um, and if you take a major manufacturer like Industra, uh, they have paper filters that are 98% efficient at 10 micron. I would say that's probably the, a good standard for conditioning for most of the equipment. So that's a good filtration for lobes. That's good filtrations for multi-stages. Um, it's not quite good enough for screws or turbos. If we go to those, we're usually looking for something that's 99% efficient at two to three micron. Um, the reason for that is we have very tight clearances in the equipment. You can imagine the two screws rotating together have tighter clearances um, than uh, older technology that can cause wear and tear if you're not getting those um, particles out. 
The high-speed turbos also have very tight tolerances and running at those very high speeds. If you're impinging sand or dirt particles on the impeller over time, that will wear the impeller down, um, get into the electrical um, areas as well. So it tends to be 98% at 10 as kind of a baseline. And for screws and turbos, usually manufacturers are putting their own filters in to ensure this, but ours are 99% at the two to three micron mark. Thank you. And we are already over time. So I'm going to ask that if you could close up with any final um, remarks, Travis, and then I will um, um, do the conclusion. Yeah, I think the main takeaway here is, um, you know, operating power is going to continue to be a focus for everyone. We want more efficient equipment, especially for main aeration processes. Um, it's better for our uh, wastewater treatment plants to have lower energy bills. It's better for us on CO2 emissions. It's going to continue to be a focus point. Um, what we want to make sure is that as engineers spec equipment or as plants replace equipment, uh, you know what you had before, you know what you're looking at in the future. And you really want to make sure you get your ambient conditions considered. Make sure you're going to get equipment that can run your plant in the summertime. Consider the how hot it's going to be in your room. Make sure you're asking manufacturers those questions. Make sure you're getting performance data. Um, the same across the board for everyone at your design condition so you can really understand how much power you're going to need, what your electrical bills are going to be, and if you're going to have enough air during the hotter times uh, of the year. Um, on the maintenance side um, and the power loss side, it's good to plan for those things. I think it's important. It's not so important to know how your machinery reacts to the power loss necessarily, other than maybe the generators, but um, that knowledge will help you understand what's going to go on with your equipment. You should understand that from some degree, Make sure you have some sort of good maintenance plan for the equipment. Uh, long term, your equipment will run better. Have it done by yourself with qualified personnel. Make sure you're doing your scheduled maintenance or make sure your manufacturer is coming out to do it for you with their experts. So that's it. Thank you so much, Travis. I do want to just take one more um, moment to thank everyone for attending today. And thank you, Travis, for a great presentation. I'd also like to thank Atlas Copco for sponsoring today's event. As a reminder, the recording will be available later today on that eShowcase landing page. And we will send all registrants an email tomorrow with this link. And we'd love to invite you to join us again. So visit our event calendar to sign up for future webcasts. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone.